Okay, welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. More importantly, we were talking baseball in the green room. And our wonderful, wonderful guest, Katie Warnick, founder and CEO of Staffing Boutique. She is like the woman I want to be when I grow up. Because <laughs> she has, Katie, tell us what you have behind home plate. Oh, I have season tickets to the Yankees games. So I, I have a quarter package. That's 20 games. But I take clients there and have a really good time. But I was just going to say that the person that sits next to me has three daughters and his youngest is 17. Aaron Judge comes out of the dugout and she's like, 99, I love you. Say it back. And she's like my favorite. <laughs> I'm 99, I love you. Say it back. Oh, my God. It's like the best. You know... Now I know where your seats are. I'm going to watch those games here in the West and I'm going to see if I can't get a picture of you and send it to you because that is just the coolest thing. Literally, I can't imagine a better thing. I re I'm just like, wow. Now, I always thought you were cool and genius and super smart and right on top of this whole crazy human relations, staffing ecosystem that is such an important part of the nonprofit sector. But the baseball stuff is like the best. So. There's nothing more American than watching baseball and having a beer in the summer. <laughs> I, know. I know. Well, we got to talk about modern modern resume strategies because now I think you're going to help me figure out how I can get a job with the Yankees. Because oh, I love that story. I'm, I'm going to listen to all of this mm -hmm. with bated breath to figure out what is going on here. Um, so this is going to be really fun because for, for folks that don't really understand this, it has changed the trajectory of how things are going now in, in, um, staffing and, and how we manage this, this process of getting a job, looking at, for a job, you know, securing a job. Katie Warnick is the amazing CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique. Staffing Boutique is one of our valued partners, along with American Nonprofit Academy, Bloomerang, 180 Management Group, Fundraisers Friday, Your Part-Time Controller, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. We have an amazing cohort that we've created of co-hosts. Say that fast, three times. They come from all over the country. They're incredibly diverse and thought action indeed. And so I hope you're getting to know them and, and watch them because they're just amazing. As is the amazing Katie Warnick, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique. You can find her at staffingboutique.org. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks for having me. Twice so Katie, this summer. I know. It's nice. I was thinking last summer you were at Wimbledon. This is like the sports show, right? Last I, love, I love live events. I love live sporting events. I'll go to anything. Yeah, me too. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's 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 quintessentially American in so many ways. And but we're going to talk about something here today, which we've never really addressed with you um, or your team. Mm -hmm. And that's resumes. And I was thinking, Katie, as we were getting ready to do this show, resumes haven't really changed over the last 100 years. Right. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, the single sheet, maybe two sheets on a certain type of paper. It was very, you know, uh, structured. And if you went off the board, you were like, oh, you know, they all yeah. had to be the same. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to, I think, help us to figure out a different path. So talk about this digital resume thing. Like, is it a thing? Well, yeah, it's a thing because we're constantly sending resumes electronically. I always remember my one of my last bosses before I started my own firm said that they would, you know, doing staffing, they would literally have to walk resumes to clients, you know, because he worked in the staffing industry in the 70s before email. And I, was, I can't I still can't believe that, you know, when you're thankful so, for something, you have to be thankful for electronic resumes. Right. So, yeah. So so digital resumes are huge. I mean, it it's kind of a catch 22 because you're given a lot more space where when we were working off of paper resumes, you know, everyone kind of kept it to one or two pages, you know, so sometimes we get seeing resumes that could go on for like four to six pages. And that's a lot. Uh -huh. and no one is reading a resume for four to six pages. So, you know, we, you really need to be precise and targeted on what you're doing. Obviously people who have been working 
a lot longer are going to have longer resumes, but I think keeping it short and one to two pages digitally is just as important as it would be if it was a hard paper copy. Interesting. I, you know, I never thought about that. Um, are you, are you seeing like that same, you know, structural thing? I mean, I, I noticed over the last couple of years, people putting um, images like their own image or headshot on resumes. And back so, in the day, that was started. like, don't get me started. Yeah. So, talk <laughs> that yeah was like, I, mean, I am, I am a stickler for resumes. Um, one of the first jobs I had, my boss, Matt, um, had, made every single one of our candidates put their resume into our template, which meant that every time that we were sending out a resume at, from a staffing firm perspective, the client was getting the same resume format. But so my job was to make sure that the resume was coming in correctly in our format template. And it, it, you know, no one can do it, you know, and it was so easy. It was like name, education, where you worked and then bullets. And, you know, the fonts and the formatting were never, Correct. You know, I think that people don't look at those things, especially if you make a resume at one point, maybe you use one font and then you add on a couple of years later, you use another font. You're not if you don't pay attention to detail on that. And then you have someone looking at your resume that is insane about attention to detail. They are kind of disregarding your resume, even if your fonts are different, you know, so right. you really have to look at, at a formatting. Um, your margins, all of those things come through, obviously, on a digital resume. I love that you said that because I'm like a font queen. And I can I can woman up and say, if somebody sends me something in a wackadoo font, I can't get beyond it. I can't get to the content because I'm just like, what the hell? Why are they sending an email in Comic Sans? You know, it looks like a cartoon. Or they'll have like sentence case in one spot and then it's a different case in another or even the bullet points you know how hard it is to format bullet points in a word yeah. document and you know so they'll have bullet points start halfway and then they just can't get them in line like those sorts of things i'm insane about but in terms of just digital resumes um we see a lot of pictures headshots on resumes from candidates that are international candidates that seems to be the norm in other countries um, so we could kind of spot out someone who's not living in the U S by someone sending a resume with a, with a headshot on it. The only other time that I have seen headshots on resumes and it is access acceptable is if it's more like marketing or brand management, but that's not really our expertise or that's not what I'm dealing with. But that, mm -hmm. in that case, it's typical, um, for the purposes of the jobs that we're recruiting for within the sector, I think an easy layout, literally just black and white, your Times New Roman, you know, 12 or 11 point font is completely okay. sufficient. Um, no graphics, maybe linking in your LinkedIn is, mm -hmm. is the best place I would go. But I don't think that infographics and website design goes on a resume for the jobs that we are speaking about typically on the show. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, a lot of like tables, like those sorts of things. There's no need for that on a resume. Um, if you have a professional summary that could be in that, you know, separate from your resume. But I think that your resume really just needs to show your education, your name. I think address is really important because, you know, we as a recruiter, especially we're looking at, at candidates who are local. So if you don't have your address on it, you know, at least see in city and state, we kind of rule that out. We want to know where you are, especially within the boroughs. Um, and then just your experience. Interesting. I'm fascinated by this because um, it's not what I thought you would say. Like some of it, yes, but some of it, no. So just to clarify, you are saying no on the headshot. Don't put that in there. Don't put the headshot. No, no headshots. Just to clarify, just to clarify, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because I think it's kind of an, a weird thing to well, talk about. There's also like a discrimination aspect on that, well, yeah. right? So yeah. there really shouldn't be a headshot. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about this next part, and this aligns to the digital nature, and that is keywords. I mean, mm -hmm. how are these resumes being looked at? Are they being run through software? Yeah. Or so what does this look like? Yeah. So one more thing about the last slide that we spoke about is the easier. So 
we all have these applicant tracking systems, right? So staffing firms or nonprofits, any HR department has something established this like this to collect resumes. They're coming in through your website on your apply, apply here, work for us. Your resumes are being thrown into that pool and then they're getting added to that database if you're emailing directly, right? We, we do that as well. And so what's happening is the more stuff that you have on your resume, the harder it is for the applicant tracking system to read that correctly. It's called parsing the resume. So essentially your name needs to come over in the first name field, your email, it needs to come over. And if you have sort of all of that fancy other stuff and your fonts are weird and you have infographics, it throws off that parse system and then the resume doesn't come over. And nine times out of 10, we as recruiters or people reviewing this will just disregard that as trash rather than even looking at it because you're not inputting it correctly into our system. That's why whenever I do job posts, I always say, send me your resume as a word attachment or a, um, a PDF, because that's going to be the easiest way to get it into our system. Everything else is trash. So now moving on to the keywords, that is kind of like the same thing, right? So now all of these resumes are funneled into this applicant tracking system, which is why the keywords are so important because most cases, a hiring manager in our case or an internal um, recruiter at a nonprofit gets a job from, let's just say, development. And they say, I always use the the example of Razor's Edge, find me someone with Razor's Edge that it's applied here. So what do they do? They go in and they keyword search Razor's Edge to all the applicants that they have in their applicant tracking system. And then they could quickly just go through anyone they've spoken to recently or anybody that it's applied to the job in the past couple of months. So that's why keywords are so important. And it's so important that the font, the font comes over and the format comes over correctly. And most times that's going to be in your, your words and your PDFs. Okay. Wow. That blows my mind because I kind of, thought that maybe that was going on, but I've never spoken to anybody who articulated that in such a fashion because, mm -hmm. you know, when you hear folks that are um, looking for jobs and I mean, I, I run into this people that I'm thinking, holy moly, they are like the top of their game. And they'll be like, yeah, I've been sending out, you know, my resume or I've been responding and I haven't gotten any response or it hasn't mm -hmm. worked. Um, I'm wondering, Katie, if this is one of the first stumbling blocks that people are having. Yeah, for sure. I think it's really important that you put any sort of software that you've learned throughout your career mm -hmm. on your resume. You know, you might think of the first uh, software you worked on as maybe, you know, extinct or something like that. But you never know. There could be a small nonprofit that is still using that software. So that goes a long way. The other thing, too, is, you know, HR is HR. They're not fundraisers and they're not even always necessarily, <clears throat> excuse me, nonprofit professionals. Right. So, right. right. For example, you know, uh, a director of development says to a human resources recruiter, hey, find me someone with um, planned giving experience. Do you think that that recruiter knows what planned giving is? No, no, they're relying on a keyword search, you know, like, let uh, me search all the people with planned giving or um, in kind gifts or something like that, uh, gala experience. So all of those things really need to be articulated on your resume to come up in a query that the HR person or the staffing firm is running specifically for a search that they're working on. Genius. Again, I would have never thought of that because you just think, oh, the, the, this is the vocabulary, the nomenclature that I use, that we use in our sector. So everybody's going to get it, but not the case. That is brilliant. And I am thrilled that you brought that up. That's absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so now you've like totally blown my mind. I have so many questions. Now I want to go back to the old school part. And should we have a physical copy of a resume? I'm thinking like you work with, you know, within the parameters, which you just described. And then ultimately you go to maybe meet somebody or you have that physical thing. It used to be you would always see the job candidates because they had that that port leather portfolio or file yeah. <laughs> in the resume. Is that even still being done? I don't know. No, I think that that still happens. Um, I think that it is important if you are doing an in-person interview, I always tell my candidates, bring a few copies of your resume with you because you can't assume that 
the person you're meeting with is going to print it out. And a lot of times they like to take notes. So it is convenient to just have your resume, you hand them a copy. And you know, so many times interviews go well, where they say, hey, you have a few extra minutes, maybe you can meet one of my colleagues and I'll drag someone in. And then that person needs a copy of the resume too, because they might be coming in blind. They might've not even seen your resume on the computer prior to, right? So then they could take some notes. You know, sometimes it's, it might not, they may have it printed out already, but it, it doesn't hurt to bring a few copies. You look prepared, you look professional, you're ready to go. And if you don't need them, you know, you don't need them. You didn't, you didn't lose anything there. Genius. Yeah, that's super smart. And I, and I love your idea about um, all of a sudden you're chatting with other folks or other team mm -hmm. members and here, yeah. here's that. Yeah, that's really smart. When I'm thinking about this, what is the relationship to how a resume should look physically to how it looks digitally? Should it be the exact same or can you can you kind of create be more artistic or creative in that physical copy? No, I think you bring the same resume that you sent them. OK, OK. So just keep it the standard shtick mm -hmm. and, and let it go. Yeah. And and, you know, you're you're saying like, and of course I'm dating myself, but like white you know, a heavier, thick, thicker paper, not gray. What, I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? I am white and black, white paper, black, <laughs> black ink, and that is it. As simple as you can do. <gasps> okay. Okay. I kind of figured you would say that, but I was like, I need to clarify that mm -hmm. um, because I'm just, I'm so, I almost want to say, Katie, I'm challenged by this. You know, it's such a new, um, and different way of going about something that, like I, we said at the top of the show, has not changed for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And I've got to believe that it's it's kind of one of those things that if you ask folks around you, they might not know. Mm -hmm. So this is a question I have that's just kind of like an off the top um question, but I've been noticing in the marketplace that there are now companies that will do your resume for you. You know, they'll format it and they'll, they'll get it. Is that because it's more digitally friendly and should we be looking at that versus trying to do it ourselves? I think that that's an industry because some people have no idea about anything regarding resumes. You know, I obviously, I work in a staffing firm. My mom was in HR. So I've kind of grown up hearing about the word resume and headhunter and all those things. Um, if you have no idea where to start, sure, hiring someone to do that, that's fine. I think that you can just Google search templates and plug and play there. If okay. you have a problem coming up with content, I think that that's really important that you, um, maybe hire a resume writer or a resume designer because some people just can't put their experience to paper. Um, and, and that's okay too, but, it, but at least you have someone to kind of coach you through that. I think that that's when that's important. You know, Katie, it's really interesting because with this conversation, I'm getting two tracks here. One is like, to use your word, what is the content? What is it that we're putting forth to communicate ourselves, mm -hmm. communicate about ourselves? Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, how do we communicate? I think it's fascinating that you brought up um, the disconnect sometimes between the hiring managers and the hiring company versus understanding like what the technological aspect of a job is. So like you said, gala management, fundraising, mm -hmm. you know, planned giving the software, that's kind of a different issue from than how things look. And you have to marry those two. It sure. sounds like. Yeah, 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 there's definitely two components there. Again, you know, I love HR, but I hate HR because HR knows <laughs> HR and they don't know the the areas that they're recruiting for. And, and that's that's across the board. That's not in nonprofits, you know. That's why when you see so many places, like if you see Google hiring or Tesla hiring, they need a technical recruiter. They need someone who understands the technical terminology behind these positions that they're filling, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's not always specific to every industry. Right. Technical recruiter. I love that. And again, that's something that I hadn't really even thought of or heard of before. Um, <clears throat> okay. This is the next kind of like off the wall question. I have an opinion and I'm interested to hear about yours, but should someone that's not looking for a job have a current resume? And I mean, I think a lot of us are like, I want to live in this world with my nonprofit till the day I get carried out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what are your thoughts on this? Yes. As a tool? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I think it's so important. Um, 
definitely to update it if you think that you might potentially be moving at some point. A lot of times we go, especially in nonprofits, you know, you have your resume, you get the job, and then you're promoted within. So I think that every time you get maybe a different title or you start to manage someone else, mm-hmm. add that to your resume. It doesn't have to be you know ready to go, but just add that because you might forget like when that promotion happened and, and those dates and those are those are important. So just adding those in. Um, I've had my own company since 2011. Um, as a staffing firm and temporary agency, we do have to carry, you know, insurance, workers' comp liability, et cetera. Every time I have to renew my insurance, I have to present my resume. So yeah, it's true. literally the same resume since I started my company since 2011, but I have to update it and send it to them. I had to have a resume to get the insurance in the first place. And the same thing with our bank that funds us. They ask me for a resume every year. So even though as a business owner, I do have, you know, a working resume that I have to update as we grow. Fascinating. I would have never thought of that. So I was thinking, (laughs) yeah, I mean, it's, it's a document, right? It's a document just like you would have, you know, any other uh, policy statements or Mm -hmm. IRS forms. I mean, I think it's, I think that's just good business to have that. Mm But what I was thinking, Katie, is that a lot of times, you know, especially if you're a younger member of our sector, you get tapped on the shoulder to maybe apply for a different grant or professional development or perhaps board service or commission work or community, you know, participation. And so I think the folks that have that document ready to go, Mm. I think they come ahead at a faster rate, right? I mean, I think it's like... You know, we are we are begging for people to serve on commissions and it's everything from like a park commission to a cultural, you know, commission. I mean, there um, and then, of course, board work um, and then last but not least awards. Yeah. You know, if you want to apply for a certain type of award or whatever, that is a tool that a, a lot of people can't get past. They don't have it. And so they're like, oh, I can't I can't participate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and when you're doing those things, as you move through your career, it's important to record those on your resume as well. You know, so that's kind of like a good place to update what you're doing every time you volunteer with a new organization or, you know, you run a marathon for a cause or whatever. Update that on your resume. Um, The other thing, too, is I get a lot of people on LinkedIn or people I know that will just hit me up like, hey, I'm starting to think about a job search or, hey, Katie, I saw you posted this job, you know, kind of like that casual conversation. Mm -hmm. And my response is always the same. Send me an updated resume. I'm not going to entertain a phone conversation with you. I'm not going to give you my time unless I know that you're serious enough to actually have a resume to send to me because my conversation with you is going to mean nothing if I don't see where you're coming from and your career path, right? Mm -hmm. So why am I going to have a conversation with you if we're going to have to have a conversation again once I have your resume, you know? Right. Yeah. And I appreciate you saying that because I get asked and like you a lot. Can I just jump on a call and pick Mm -hmm. your brain or whatever? And it's like, no, every minute of my day is jam packed and I don't have that time. Um, unfortunately. Yeah. So I love that you said that because I can see that conversation going a lot of different ways Mm -hmm. or opportunities presenting themselves when you have a document that can be reviewed. Yeah. You're not getting my time. If you're not motivated enough to make a resume to send to me, it it just doesn't make sense for me at this point. Yeah, I love it. I think that's really, I, I appreciate you saying that. I think it's it's bold, but I think it's more importantly, it's um, really, it's accurate. It's accurate yeah. for how we're going to invest in somebody else and help them, you know, move along. Okay, before I let you go, I got to kind of ask this question that I'm curious that's kind of popped into my brain as we've been talking. When you are chatting with people or you're looking out across the landscape, What percentage of our sector or population do you think are prepared with this accurate and and well styled resume? I mean, are we like 50 percent of people? I do think I do think 50 percent because, you know, as many people, you know, want to stay in their nonprofit forever. I think that the reality of what the sector looks like you know, it's never really set, you know, with grants being cut and budgeting and always sort of issues. And, you know, when we look at good 
development people or good program people at this point, and I would say for the past, you know, 10 to 12 years, they're moving jobs like every two to three years because a $5,000 raise to someone in corporate may not be much to someone in corporate, but in, in the nonprofit sector, $5,000 in a raise is, is a huge, I you know, a huge jump up, you know? So if someone gets offered that to do the same job or a better job in a similar nonprofit for $5,000, they're, they're moving, you know? And that's why I talk about retention so much, but that's a whole nother, you know, story. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating conversation. And I am stunned that you would say only 50%. Um, a lot of the things that you talked about today were new for me to know and re recognize. I mean, I could kind of recognize just from LinkedIn to see how people are doing things and mm -hmm. speaking about this. Um, and then, of course, this explosion of folks that do resume design or crafting, whatever word you want to call. Um, but Katie Warnick, CEO and founder of Staff and Boutique. You know, I always feel, Katie, that you're the person on the front lines that are seeing these trends and seeing things before a lot of us in other parts of the country, you know, as it moves forward, being in the East Coast. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like you're on the front lines and then it kind of starts to bleed out and, and move across. So I always appreciate getting the info first from you and really learning from you because it's... Um, it's absolutely fascinating. And in this time of change, when that we have so many CEOs and C-suite folks retiring and leaving, we need these next gen leaders to step up. And if they don't have the right tool, um, you know, they're, they're falling by the wayside. So I'm really appreciate that. I really appreciate that you've come on to talk with us about this. So thank you. My pleasure. I have hey. this Facebook status that I think I, I wrote in 2011. I always reshare it every year. And it was basically just don't put your pic picture on your resume. Don't put your picture on your resume. Don't put your picture on your resume. <laughs> like 10 times I wrote it. And so every time it comes up as a memory from 2011, I'm like, still accurate. Like, don't yep. put your picture on your resume. <laughs> still accurate. Yeah. yeah. And, you well, know, you the other thing when I was talking about discrimination, you know, when you're a staffing firm and someone comes in to register with the agency, they do paperwork. Mm -hmm. It's changed a little since COVID, but we would have to have a paper file electronically for their resume and application. And that had to be separate with then their I-9 information because mm -hmm. you couldn't have what someone looked like you know, next to their qualifications, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why we're putting pictures on resumes. Right. Well, I mean, think about in the cultural um, nonprofit sector, you know, if you go, let's say, say to a to a, um, audition for a chamber orchestra or a symphony or even, you know, a jazz band, um, it's supposed to be blind. You're supposed to do it by behind a curtain. And in, in the last 15 years, they've they've made a standard practice where you walk out on a carpet so that you can't determine the heels. if it's a woman or a man. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm totally forget who it was, but I had this, we were at a woman in development luncheon last year and it was like the keynote speaker was from the symphony and she was a career fundraiser, but she had started as a musician and she had said when she had auditioned like 40 years ago, that was an issue. You know, she, it was behind a curtain, but she had hung heels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it's really, and I, I feel like that kind of links to what we've been talking to mm -hmm. Katie. I mean, it, 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 it reflects that. And it's like, who, who are you um, as an educated, qualified person to lead um, in our sector versus what do you look like? Right. It's a big, big question. And um, it is, it's been fascinating to have you on again, Katie Warnick, CEO and founder of Staffing Boutique. Check out their site, staffingboutique.com. Dot org, and you can learn so much about what they do, how they do it. And really, I think Katie's one of those masterminds um, that we all need to know. Um, and then, of course, look for her at the Yankees games. Yeah, right behind home plate. <laughs> I love it. I think it's like the coolest thing. I really, really do. I so appreciate you, Katie. Another thing that we really appreciate on the nonprofit show are our amazing sponsors. They include Bloomerang. American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, which is a new episode, a new show that we're doing every Friday just for 
the topic of fundraising and fundraisers, and then 180 Management Group. So these are the folks that support us day in and day out. Katie, as we end every episode, you know you've heard this drill, but it really still means a lot to all of us here on the nonprofit show. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody. Have a